So I wanted to talk about, in case people aren't familiar with why Putin is talking so much about history and how this relates to the legacy of Soviet Marxism-Leninism or Marxism-Leninism in general, the first thing I want to say is that to sum up what Marxism-Leninism is, communism with a capital C, I'm not talking about any vague <coughs> leftism or any vague communism, I'm talking very specifically about what was synthesized by Stalin, is an outlook and a view which is based on, first, insight into the laws guiding his historical development. That's what is on paper. But in practice, in content, what this actually amounts to is a, a role that is designated with the task of defending the integrity of history. The outlook towards history that's based on looking at the historical being of your civilization or your country or the world for that matter as one, I don't know, totality is um, too strong of a word because it implies it's closed, but really one entirety, you know, one whole, if you will. This means looking at history not in a one-sided way where you're neglecting certain elements, but you're looking at it from in a more holistic perspective, basically, right? You're not leaving everything out. Now, how could that be related to Marxism? Well, if you boil down Marxism, it's just a very vulgar sense of what it's known as at least, the outlook of Marxism with regard to contemporary modern society, or just maybe modern society of the 19th century, and the class analysis, a perspective which accords society recognition not on the basis of a one-sided perspective, but on the basis of the recognition of class antagonisms. And on the one hand, you could say Marxism looks at society in a way where society is divided, but the recognition of that division actually amounts to a view of society according to which society is one thing. It's one whole. It's one entirety. You're not, for example, looking at it in a one-sided way where you lack affordance for the consideration of an antagonism, a contrasting interest, for example. Fast forward a, 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 long, a long time after the 19th century when Marxists are at the heads of a state specifically the Russian state, which has a unique relationship to all of this, I would say. But that same logic is then applied to history because the class struggle is not just now, it's a historical phenomena. There's also contradictions in history. And these contradictions need to be given recognition by recognizing the integrity of history, the integration of all history. I mean, you have to understand how fundamental this is to Marxism-Leninism. We have an outlook and a worldview. Well, was that worldview shared by people 2,000 years ago? It wasn't. So who's right and who's wrong? Are we just going to be relativists? Well, the Marxist or the minimally Hegelian position is that the continuous transformation and development of history constitutes one integral reality. And you say, well, how can that integral reality also have contradictions? And then I say, the recognition of those contradictions is the content of that integral reality. That's what gives it content. So when we say we, we understand society as one thing, one uh, integral existence or one integral reality, we should say, it's the recognition of, of the contradiction between the form of the integral totality and the content that actually is the in integrity of history and society and reality. That is what gives it integrity. It's one concrete totality. So Putin's perspective is going to be historical. When I say historical, I mean it's historically informed perspective and it's a historically focused perspective precisely because that outlook was given according to the education he received in the Soviet era. I mean, he may, he may not even be aware of how profoundly that shaped his outlook, but it Alas, it has. His perspective with regard to religion is is likewise Marxist-Leninist. Because what's the first thing he said of why is Russia Orthodox Christian? What did he say? Did you hear it? Did you catch it? He said historically. He gave a historical perspective. This is what this is the same as Stalin's perspective. When Stalin talked to uh, Enver Hoxha, the leader of Albania, communist leader of Albania at the time, uh, Hoxha was doing a massive crackdown on Islam, and Stalin talked to Hoxha and he said Islam has been ingrained in the hearts, in the minds and the consciousness of the people for hundreds of years. You think you're going to eliminate that? The religious feelings of the people should not be offended. That's the direct quote from Stalin. He wasn't giving a perspective that's religiously partisan where he's saying in a fanatical sense like this religion is correct or this one is incorrect. He's understanding religion in the sense of an objective reality. He's understanding religion in terms of this is objectively a part of history. This is objectively a part of society. You may have your opinion on it. I may have my opinion, but you should respect that reality. And that holds 
it's true not just for the Marxist-Leninist perspective of religion, but for all history. You know, the number one enemy of, of communism was historical nihilism. The recent Chinese documentary on historical nihilism actually claims that the historical nihilism of the late Soviet era was a fundamental contributing factor to the dissolution of the USSR, which is a strange thing to hear from a Marxist perspective because it seems like it's an immaterial factor. People's view of history is somehow material, but it, it's not only material, it, it constitutes the material content of the proletarian dictatorship taken from a broad civilizational and historical perspective. Safeguarding the integrity of history is a material reality. Remembering history is a material reality because all it means is that you're, you have a specific insight into your society, into your civilization, which accounts for not only its various potentialities, but for how it has been shaped. That's an indispensable factor to be able to recognize the law, not only the laws governing historical development, but the material reality of your country. Chinese communists have to know about ancient Chinese history in order to govern China today. Not because they're crudely applying some facts of Chinese history thousands of years ago to the present, but because they have a continuous living insight into how the current reality they govern China today is exists. How, how did this come to be? And how it came to be is an indispensable fact as far as what it is. How, how something came to be is fundamental to what something is. And the Western perspective doesn't have an integral view of history. Now, as far as Russia's place in Western history, Russia is the integration of European history. Russia looks at European history in its totality. It's geographically evident. Europe is this splintered and balkanized mess. And here you have Russia, this continuous unified territory. And it's just kind of exemplifies their relationship, not only between Russia and Europe, but also Russia to European history itself. Russia has always seen itself as a messianic force, which represents the true unity of the West and of Europe. And paradoxically speaking, this is exactly what makes it Eastern. I want you to keep in mind what I'm saying about historical nihilism. It's always been a fundamental enemy of Marxism-Leninism for the reasons I just gave you, because the Marxist view is based on what? The recognition of contradictions, material contradictions within society and within history. Simultaneously, the ability to recognize those contradictions gives you a more holistic perspective rather than a one-sided uh, perspective. That doesn't mean you're above the contradictions. It's precisely the proletarian perspective that represents the universal one. But that universalist perspective doesn't only apply to today's society, but also the past. And Boris Groys talks about this in The Total Art of Stalinism. So this is something you should understand about Putin. Now, he said something interesting about Russia and China, for that matter, as you can apply to China, maybe, stands on the emergence of American unipolarity. And I think a lot of this is a kind of tragedy which led to the events of Maidan and the whole phenomena of color revolutions because we may say that color revolutions only happen because of the CIA. There's truth to that. They wouldn't be able to happen without the CIA. But at the same time, there's something about color revolutions which is obviously persuasive to the young people that participate in them. As though they understand and recognize how the globalist American empire is intervening in their societies, but see this rise of globalism precisely itself as a kind of lucrative, uh, new, uh, unavoidable, cutting-edge reality that they want to have a part of. It's like the color revolutionaries, so so-called revolutionaries, they know the CIA is doing all this shit. That's precisely what makes it appealing to them, because they want to escape the confines of their, yes, corrupt, parochial, back Backward societies and join the future and enter the future and for them globalism American globalism represents the future but I want to draw your attention to something I find profoundly ironic about for example the Maidan Europe represents the future Ukraine under Yanukovych represents backwardness represents the parochial corrupt oligarchical society but in reality it was the oligarchs who supported Maidan why because Putin was centralizing and integrating the Russian economy to such an extent, also politically, that is undercutting the power, political power at least, of the oligarchs. So the profound tragedy of the Ukraine situation is that all of the dreams of the Maidan protesters about this European, universalistic, open, global society, that's the, it's the opposite. It's Russia. This is what far-right people say as well, but it's, 
In a sense, it's true. Russia is the true global society. Russia, the polarity, the pole of Russia, is not just some backward, parochial, and corrupt nation-state. Russia represents a universal, cutting-edge, and global vision. It's a particular form of globality. And I don't mean globality in the sense of wanting to conquer the world, but in the sense of having a perspective worldly of our objectively more integrated, diverse, etc., etc. world. Russia is not a petty nationalistic state. It's actually the real content of the dreams of those people who thought they can escape the parochial corruption of Ukraine by looking toward the West. This is the irony of almost every revolution in history, in a sense. The irony is that, for example, the French Revolution, in many ways it was a bourgeois revolution. But who really carried out the bourgeois revolution? It wasn't the French Republic, it was Mitternach and uh, the British and the Restorationists who solidified the power of the bourgeoisie, right? So in, in some vaguely similar sense, Maidan inadvertently participated in Russia as a global civilization taking form. This notion of the Russian world world finally acquires a more substantive reality after Maidan. And simultaneously, the corruption and, and the anti-oligarchical sentiment that some claim is, is vaguely there in Maidan, well, that actually really acquires content in Russia under Putin. And among the, the consciousness of the Russian people, the lack of dependency on the West, the more integration with China, is making Russia more of a cutting-edge, forward-thinking, and so on. It's just a more, I don't want to say open and cosmopolitan because we understand the connotations but it's not like a backward petty nationalist parochial hole it's the opposite of that BRICS, china russia they represent everything the west claims to be the west says we are so open and we're so cutting edge and futuristic but it's it's the multipolar world taking form russia china and these other countries a lot of the impetus of infrared i mean typically tankies were associated with like some petty parochialism you know which sees the u.s unipolarity as this dystopian future and we must go back to the past but our whole shtick was like actually the avant-garde the cutting edge of the future is represented in like BRICS in, in Russia, China, and so on. And it's NATO and America, which are increasingly parochial and backward and out of date with the times. They haven't caught up with the times. And I, I very much appreciate that Putin gave expression to that perspective when he explained the increasingly aggressive posture of the United States is because they haven't caught up with the winds of sorry, the development of history. They're trying to resist it. And I would add, this is creating a very dangerous scenario as far as the revival of uh, destructive ideologies and realities like fascism. Real reaction. Coming back to the order of business as far as infrared is concerned, the far right on Twitter, a lot of them are starting to get banned and censored. So I see guerrillas are not really waging war on the right as much as they're defending and, and also attacking leftists trying to lay claim to the legacy of Marxism and Marxism Leninism. And you have to ask the question, it's like, we've been here a million times, but why is Marxism-Leninism, why is it aesthetically so co-opted by leftists? And I hope my perspective that I give you will make you less worried about these leftists and more focused on building the positive hegemony of, of Marxism-Leninism in the positive sense. So what is leftism? It's the ideology behind these color revolutions that Putin talked about, the Orange Revolution, and pretty much every color revolution that's occurred in the late 20th and early 21st century. But how did this come to be? Well, I've talked about the distinction between leftism and left-wing a lot, but when we're talking about leftism, what we're really talking about is something I would call pan-leftism. When I call it pan-leftism, I hope that it starts to make sense to you why that's different from a left-wing position in general. Now, let's say we're living in the era of the French Revolution or the October Revolution. There is a broad left tendency. For example, there's the left socialist revolutionaries and there's the Bolsheviks. Both of them are on the left, represent a broad left tendency. That's a concrete historical situation which gives content to that tendency. You know, there's this situation we're in as a country, let's say it's Russia after, uh, during or after World War One, and we are broadly aligned together in the same position. Sure, but, but how can there be this trans-historical, this historical leftism that everyone seems to talk about? Pan-leftism is not just a broad left-wing position in a specific concrete historical scenario, it's a retrospective integration of every of what it's perceived to be the essence of the left across all history. It's pan-leftism. You notice among infrared's biggest haters, it seems like they are red liberals. But like, 
you look at the people that they're joining forces with, they're retweeting, they're in the comments, they're in the quote tweets agreeing with them, they're in their likes, and it's never just the red liberals. It's always like anarchists are joining with them, self-proclaimed social democrats are joining with them, Trotskyists are joining with them, left comms are joining with them, and it's like they're all united in this broad tendency of like, yeah, we're all on the left. Hey, I'm a leftist, you're a leftist, right? But what are they talking about when they say leftist? Because it doesn't seem like they're talking about a concrete historical scenario because what does that mean in the United States? We used, granted, we had the Bernie movement. I would agree that vaguely speaking, that was a left-wing movement. It's gone now. There doesn't, there's no real political movement in the U.S. we could characterize as left-wing in a concrete sense, which is very strange historically, of course, but it's the truth. And But it's not only in the United States. You have these people in Denmark and in, it's an international pan-leftism. And basically, the pan-leftist, it's kind of like, it almost reminds me of like Engels, when he's described Describing Morgan's description of the Iroquois if I'm pronouncing that correctly, confederacy. It's like confederacy of tribes of the indigenous Americans. It's like, we all have this broad consensus and we have to balance it. Like, okay, I'm an ML, but I'm not going to go too far into being an ML because then I would be cut off and ostracized from the white... Now, if you notice this about leftism, anyone who insists too much on the particularity of their specific tendency leaves the... Leaves the consensus that's called leftism. For example, when anarchists so much insist upon their anarchist tendency, they cease to be compatible with the broader leftism and they start to kind of go in a more right-wing direction. And this holds true for Trotskyists and obviously Infrared is insisting upon Marxism-Leninism, nothing else. We don't share anything in common with someone who's calling himself uh, Trotskyite or we're not, well, well, we're part of some broad pan-leftist tendency. No, we're, we're we're, very, we're something very specific. And because we have insisted upon the specificity of a specific theoretical outlook at the expense of all others, we are basically outside of this kind of pan-leftist consensus, which everyone is who's in it kind of implicitly agrees. Listen, I may be wrong, you may be wrong, but at least we're all together in this broad pan-leftist camp. And what is the content of the pan-leftism? And it's what it is, is going back full circle, it's historical nihilism. Because when when you distill the essence of political change for change's sake, you no longer recognize concrete and objective historical formations as objective realities. You come to regard all of them as these kinds of reactionary vestiges which need to be annihilated wholesale. So pan-leftism is the ideology of historical nihilism. And that's why for so long it has been the ideology of the American deep state and the cultivation of color revolutions around the world. And it's almost a mockery of the historical left. I mean, it is a mockery. What, what the CIA and ruling class is basically done is, is is something very similar to what the Nazis did to the label of socialism. If you read reports about how the Nazis regarded their self-identification as socialists, more or less, they thought it was a form of rebellious mockery. Like, oh yeah, we're going to call ourselves socialists to kind of get back and as a form of revenge and mockery. Like, they were trolling, basically, the real socialists. That's what their identity of socialism was. So it's similar when it comes to pan-leftism. I want you to notice something. Isn't pan and leftism always at least semi-ironic distance with the patriarchal authorities that they vaguely uh, identify with. Like, do pan-leftists really take Marx seriously? Do they really take Engels seriously? Do they really take Lenin and Stalin seriously? They don't. They see them as memes, as ironical kind of incarnations of what the ruling class viewed as these destructive anti-historical tendencies. They have their own meta-narrative about Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and so on, which is not integral with the, them themselves. None of them are really Leninists. None of them are really Marxists. They are people who have a type of conceit about what Marx and Lenin really represented, which is at an ironic distance from those authors. Like, basically, I've seen so many of these tweets like, oh, Marx didn't know that he was actually gay. And they, like, make a gay Marx or a transgender Marx meme. And they're like, he didn't know this. And 
and it's almost like they're mocking Marx, which reminds me, if you're familiar with it, it reminds me of the mockery of socialism that the Nazis engaged in. And you say, Haas, what are you saying? I'm just saying, look at the memes by these pan-leftists about these figures. I mean, the only thing we could be charged as guilty of doing that with is probably Pol Pot, I'm gonna be honest. But that's also because we're pretty nuanced about Pol Pot. We do have a meta-narrative about what happened in Cambodia, which obviously is critical and is not saying like, oh yeah, we want to exactly replicate, or it's just this kind of ironic distance we have, which is not one and the same with it. And also, we have that a similar relationship with LaRouche in a lot of ways. Of course, we have an ironic distance. I mean, we're not actually LaRoucheites. We like LaRouche because he is this avatar that represents the anti-British meme. Uh, and, and also the land bridge thing. And there's some ideas we vaguely think are interesting there, but obviously we're not actually fully identifying with it. So it's similar with pan-leftists. If you, you don't know this because you weren't around in the, even as a small child, I could see the pan-leftist culture was the raised fist, was this notion of the integration of all the leftist tendencies of history. It's this postmodern view which basically said, okay, Emma Goldman, Bakunin, Marx, Lenin, Engels, Trotsky, all these people. I mean, go on Marxist.org and look at the front page. It's got these Che Guevara with Trotsky. And it's like Che Guevara, Castro, Trotsky, Emma Goldman, Bakunin. It's all one thing. But it's not a thing they identify with. It's a thing they have an ironic distance toward. And what it, what's the content of that distance? Basically, like, this is a post-mortem. The slogan of Platypus, who just put out a writing interview I had with him. Platypus' the slogan is the left is dead. I mean, I don't agree with Platypus on pretty much anything, but I think they might be onto something when they say the left is dead. There's some some degree, I don't agree with it necessarily, but they kind of obscure it a little bit. But pan-leftism is a post-mortem on the left, the historical left. It's a post-mortem. It's an epilogue. It's a credit scene. Nobody thinks Lenin is living. No one thinks Marx is living. For those of you that are autistic, I mean living in the sense of their ideas really do have a directly contemporary prescient and immediate significance. Nobody thinks that. They think that this is an outdated thing. Ha, la la la, it's a meme. LOL, LOL, it's a meme from the past. But we're going to use these figures, uh, these memes, to justify our post-historical, I don't know what you call it, globalistic cosmopolitan, uh, liberal position. It's like, uh, as we in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution start breaking shops and, you know, rebelling or whatever, the ghost of Marx is in an ironic way smiling upon us because the avatars of destruction, pure forces of destruction, historical destruction, now are being adopted by the ruling class, the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie has appropriated tendencies associated with the historical left, which correspond in their view to historical destructiveness. Now, the Marxist-Leninist view would say this isn't historical destruction. These are revolutionary events which participate in a deeper integration of the totality of history. So, for example, Stalin would say the October Revolution, you could say, was destructive. It was a gap in, in the development of history in the sense that it was this qualitative leap. But then Stalin says, but then we reintegrate it into the whole corpus of Russian history. We reintegrate it and assimilated into this deeper historical integrity. So, but the pan-leftist view is the opposite. It's the pure negation for negation's own sake, which has been appropriated by the bourgeoisie, or its mutated descendants, I should say. And basically, that's what pan-leftism is. It's a ironic post-mortem on the historical left, which is at a distance toward it. It's, it's got all these different subcultures. Some of them call themselves ML. Some of them call themselves Maoist. Some of them call themselves Trotskyists. But this is no different than any kind of subculture in general. It follows sociologically the same patterns of punk rock subcultures or Harry Potter su subcultures. I'm in Slytherin. You're in Gryffindor. I want you guys to understand that we are not there. So we are trying to give content to Marxism-Leninism in the 21st century, and that's a positive project. And the majority of that can't be spent on bickering with pan-leftists, because what are we bickering about? We're actually Marxist-Leninists. We actually do believe in this. It's not an ironic thing. Like, we do think Marxism-Leninism is true. And, it, and if you don't think it's true, we at the very least think it provides an important historical foundation to build off of, and we're serious about building off of that foundation. 
foundation. We're very serious about being Marxist Leninists, and I think that's why a lot of people don't take us seriously. It's not because of the silly things that I've done in the past. I've done plenty of silly things, but that's not why people don't take us seriously, because even before I did those silly things, I was receiving the same degree of mockery. You know, we were supposed to be dinosaurs who were extinct, rendered into the garbage bin of history to be ironically mocked in a post-mortem of this kind of post-modern retrospect on Lenin and Marx. I mean, Klaus Schwab has a small bust of Lenin that's wearing a businessman's suit, and it's an ironic kind of thing. He is like, yeah, of course, the era of Lenin is gone. But this is kind of a funny irony. The irony of how Lenin's revolution actually ended up being the opposite of what it was supposed to. As if that's not already anticipated by the science of Marxism and Marxism-Leninism in particular itself. The bourgeoisie regards it as an irony. We regard it as the science of history. Of course, contradictions are something we recognize, not something we dwell upon and contemplate from a position of conceit as ironic. People, you, you need to understand when, we, when we're talking about cultivating interest in the study of Marxism-Leninism, we're not doing this to signal some kind of position within the broader pan-leftist consensus. By the way, that doesn't mean we're right-wing either. It, we are trying to build a left-wing politics in the United States, but a concretely left-wing politics. A left-wing politics defined by a particular character and a particular content based on a specific concrete historical situation. Not this pan-leftism, Emma Goldman and Che Guevara and all, they're all dancing together. No, that's, I'm sorry, like, that's not where we're coming from. And because we're not coming from there, people mistakenly view us as right-wing, but I think there's a lot of people who even identify as right-wing who probably wouldn't identify as that if they actually knew that just because they're not pan-leftist doesn't mean they're right-wing. There's plenty of people who are like, I, I do believe in nationalizing you know, industry. I do believe in black people and white people are equal. I'm against racism, but I'm just not with these pan-leftists. So they think that they're right-wing and they go down this stupid rabbit hole and they go down these stupid pipelines where eventually they're pro-Hitler and they're pro-fascism. And it's really a tragedy because people don't understand. The young, young people are so stratified politically. And I think it's mainly a kind of sexuality or gender thing because straight men are solidly right-wing who are young, solidly in the right-wing camp. But are they really right-wing, or are they just not part of this pan-leftist subculture? And there's a, you know, there's a lot of independent thinkers who, who be like, well, Haas, they're not just categorized as that, they actually become that, and I agree, and I think it's a tragedy. Because I think when people start getting labeled as right-wingers, they internalize it, they adopt it, and then they go down these stupid rabbit holes, adopting positions they otherwise wouldn't have. Is it pan-leftism to f defend the people's democracies? Look, I, I think you're confused, all right? Pan-leftism is not... I think you're talking about how in the people's democracies, the social democrats and communists collaborated. And what you're talking about is the popular front. No, I'll directly address that. The popular front was not pan-leftist. The popular front was concretely left-wing. It was an amalgamation of left-wing, patriotic, pro-people, anti-monopolistic forces. And that was not based on ideology. It was based on a concrete historical position. So, for example, the social democratic parties uh, that were part of the popular front had a historical basis in the working class and the working class movement. I mean, they weren't just like random guys saying, I'm a sock dem, I'm social and done left, I'm a this, I'm... No, that was an actual, like, real working class movement, which was, for a long time, it was disputing and it was uh, con fighting with the communists, uh, vying for influence over that movement. So, the popular front is not pan-leftist. You need to make this distinction. Just because there have been historical situations where there has been a broad cross ideological left. I gave the example of the left SRs and the Bolsheviks, but that's defined by a concrete situation, not by this kind of post historical post mortem on this, you know, universal leftism. Of course, there's a great degree of confusion because we are communists, we call ourselves that, and so do these pan leftists. So they see that and they're like, well, you're not one of us, so you must be trying to co opt our identity. And it's like, no, I, I just think you're very confused. Like, we are actually believe in it. We're not just saying we're this because we're trying to co-opt your subculture. We actually do believe in Marxism Leninism. Just like how what I say about yeah, what I say about Jeans and Lysenko is pretty inflammatory but when, when push comes to shove Jeans don't exist. And you know what? I actually do believe that 
while Lysenko may have gotten some things wrong, maybe, he definitely was unfairly maligned. A lot of people are confused about to what extent am I trolling and to what extent am I serious? Because they don't know this because they're like, it's so crazy that someone actually believes in Marxism, Leninism, and Communism. So when I'm actually trolling about separate things or trolling in a to be funny, they're like, okay, are you trolling about this too? And I just want to go full disclosure in a moment of real sincerity. Like, I'm not trolling about Marxism, Leninism, or Communism. My entire entire life since 12 years old. I was identifying with this and I was taking it very seriously. And I'm 27 now, going on 28. It's been a long time in my life. You know, I wasn't born this way. I wasn't raised communist, but I just want people to understand. Another reason I'm telling you this is because I think we're entering a new stage. I think that the era of pan-leftism and this kind of post-historical post-mortem on the historical left was very much cultivated by the intelligence department of the United States and and the open society network of global institutions and NGOs backed ultimately by the interests of monopoly finance capital is what we're talking about because monopoly industrial capital ceased to be a power since the 40s at least. I think we're entering a new stage, and this is why I'm kind of saying, you know, we don't really, the pan-leftist, we've fought with them for so many years, and I want to inform you why we need to pivot to confronting the right is because you see some of this with the rise of Millet in Argentina, but we also saw it with the neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and I think we're entering a critical stage where pan-leftism is no longer just a disguise for Nazism, it's really going to be a kind of Nazism, and I'll justify that without being hysterical. So originally, the, the strategy of color revolution was like this youthful insurrection and rebellion and breaking things and smashing things and going out into the street and you know fucking shit up whatever but i think there's a qualitatively new stage of the american hegemony or the imperialist hegemony i think that qualitatively new stage is obsian in a sense it's like okay we're not just going to be the revolutionaries anymore we're going to be the ones who have power we're going to exercise power in other words we're not just going to be the protesters throwing Molotov cocktails in the Maidan, we're going to be the Azov militias with guns going out and massacring people. So it's a qualitatively new stage of uh, NATO or whatever you want to call this, the ruling class, their, their strategy as far as what kind of ideologies they're cultivating in the youth are the ones that are preparing them to enforce agendas, not just destroy them. The era of color revolutions was just about destroying sovereign states, but now we're entering a new qualitative stage where it's about enforcing the dictatorship of financial capital. It's about inf literal Hitlerism, enforcing the dictatorship at gunpoint. And that's the new stage it's entering into. I think we've seen a, a marked rise of interest in authoritarian leftism, Maoism and stuff among the pan-leftists because of this transition that's going on. Maybe they don't know that that's just like the Azov pipeline. They've used Stalinism, for example, as a caricature of the fascist authoritarianism which the bourgeoisie now wants to unleash upon the world. The left comms, the ones who are a little more well-read than the kind of transgender Maoists, openly almost are on the verge of like directly saying like the pipeline from Bordiga to Mussolini is like, they meme about it. It's really there. So left comms in terms of their pretensions are, they're being more honest about their, the fascist orientation that the pan leftists are going into because of the role it's being used for. It's no longer color revolution and just f***ing shit up for Russia, China, Iran, or now it's enforcing terroristic dictatorship specifically on Western populations that are non-compliant with the extra constitutional and extra sovereign agenda of the ruling class. The eye on the prize and the thing you have to focus on is that the ruling, and Putin alluded to this a little bit too, the deep state, there's a center of power that's emerged in the West that is in contradiction to the form of bourgeois, whatever you want to call it, constitutional order. So this is the transition from liberalism to fascism that we saw in the 1930s that we are now experiencing. Pan-leftism is also going to go into that direction, the Azov pipeline, basically. For now, there are open as a vice within the pan leftist tendency that went too early like Dylan Burns. Dylan Burns I think I would it's fair to say he is still condemned within the pan left but he just shows them an image of their own future. He is condemned because he insisted too much on the specificity of a specific tendency but when push comes to shove and material reality takes hold however they aestheticize themselves it's going to be a fascism in practice. I think what will probably happen is that the pan leftist consensus will disappear here. 
on its own as an outmoded kind of plaything of the bourgeoisie from the 2000s, from the 90s, from the 2010s under Obama. And it's just kind of going to break apart. And there might be a guy being here like, hey, is anyone here a real leftist anymore? And it's like, that guy will be alone, right? It's everyone's going to go to the Dylan Burns style, left com, whatever you want to call it, fascist as a white tendency. So here's what I'm saying. Uh, we should fight the fascist ideology first, because if you think leftists are the main enemy well let's just fight the fascist ideology and the hitlerite ideology because that's what they're all going to transition into pretty shortly i'd give it maybe max five years they are going to transition into the openly fascistic tendency